Building a gaming PC can be a daunting process, especially for first time builders. But before you even get to screwing the whole build together, how do you avoid picking the wrong parts in the first place? And make sure that the first step of all isn't where you put a foot wrong. Well, in this video, I'll be talking to you about which components to avoid buying in 2023 and better alternatives to help you guys spec together a better build from the outset. No one wants a gaming PC with bottlenecks, performance issues, or one that lacks any future proofing or upgradability later down the line. Let's do this. Picking out the best components for a gaming PC can be the hardest part of the process. Unlike building a system where if you get something wrong, you can take it out and try again, you've only really got one shot to get the part choices right. Otherwise, it can be a costly mistake. Now, there's a few key things you want to bear in mind when selecting PC parts. Factors that go above and beyond just how well the component performs or how much it costs. Now, those things are the platform, future upgradability and physical dimensions. Now let me talk about platform to begin with. When it comes to CPUs and GPUs, you've got two main choices. On the CPU front, you've got Intel and AMD, while on the GPU front, you've got Nvidia and AMD. Graphics cards are a pretty easy one. You only tend to upgrade a graphics card every three years max. For most people, it can be four or five years time. And as they're self-contained units, as long as the physical dimensions in terms of the length, the width, and the depth fit in the case you're selecting, you're not gonna have too many problems. They come with their own video memory or already integrated and their own cooling solution, meaning you haven't got to worry quite so much about all the other parts that go along with it. Simply make sure you've got enough normal memory and a powerful enough processor that you haven't got bottlenecking and you'll be fine. I'll talk about bottlenecking a bit later though and a guide as how you can avoid it. When it comes to CPUs and processors though, it's a slightly different story as the CPU you select will have a knock-on effect on a number of different parts. For example, an Intel CPU needs a different motherboard to an AMD CPU. It might even need a different standard of memory, support different available coolers, and be overclockable, whereas its counterpart from Team Blue, Intel, or Team Red AMD may not. Take AMD's Ryzen 7000 lineup of processors. AMD's Ryzen 7000 lineup for some people has been a bit disappointing. Intel 13th gen does provide better performance on the whole, and the benchmark numbers in this synthetic benchmark speak for themselves. Intel outbeats AMD on pretty much all counts. Even AMD's new X3D lineup of processors, while look to make up some ground, don't seem to have removed it entirely. These CPUs only support the latest DDR5 memory standard, meaning an older DDR4 kit simply isn't going to work, and a more pricey DDR5 set of memory like this is a requirement. Now, 6 or 12 months ago, that would have been really bad news. DDR5 memory is getting expensive. But nowadays, things are getting better. RAM prices have fallen dramatically as the demand for DDR5s increased, and the competition amongst manufacturers has also got that bit more fierce. Plus, if you go for a DDR5 system, you'll also be able to use this RAM again later down the line, say you upgrade your processor in 3 or 4 years' time, DDR5 is still going to be the in standard for the next five or six years. Now, that's not a guarantee, but looking at how things have stacked up previously and how fast technology moves, you can be pretty certain that that will be the case. If you then compare this to the Intel architecture by comparison, you actually get support here for DDR4 and DDR5. Or should I say DDR4 or DDR5? Because the two memory standards differ so much, they don't fit in the same slots, meaning the motherboard you choose will either support DDR4 or DDR5. But the point is, with an Intel platform, you've got that option. AMD, DDR5 only. Intel 13th gen might then sound like the better shout. With support for both memory types, you've got more options as a consumer, and with a lower price point, better performance, and an overall more well-received product by both media and consumers alike, isn't it a home run for Team Blue? Mostly, but it isn't always that clear-cut. Which brings me on to my next point, upgrades and future-proofing. With these Intel processors, we're at the end of the line as far as the platform goes. Intel's 13th gen processors are the last to use Intel's latest iteration of their LGA socket and their Z690 and Z790 motherboard ranges, which span 12th and 13th gen, will soon be nearing the end of their life. They still provide exceptional performance, they're not out of date, not obsolete by any means. But for those looking potentially at a CPU upgrade in two or three years time, if you go for something like a 13th gen chip, you won't be quite so lucky. 14th gen, which we'd expect to release at either the end of this year or the first half of next year, will obviously solve that problem, but come itself with its own challenges. Take Ryzen 7000 as an example, 
example of that, as much as we criticize AMD for some of the challenges their new CPUs have had, that's largely because they're on a new, totally unoptimized architecture, and AMD is still learning about the bounds of their latest Zen 4 design. So that's sort of CPUs and memory vaguely covered. I've got a bit more of an understanding of where AMD and Intel sit in terms of their architectures, and what to expect from each of the brands. But how do I go about picking an optimal motherboard? With so many different features, motherboards are split into chipsets. Chipsets are defined by the CPU maker, Intel or AMD, and look to set about which kind of features each tier of motherboard has access to. More expensive chipsets for consumers cost more for board partners like Asus, MSI and Gigabyte to integrate, but also act as a good wayfinding system to figure out just what kind of motherboard and feature set is available. When it comes to Intel, their Z series is the top end, Z790 being the most recent, Z690 also supporting the latest 13th gen and previous 12th gen chips. In the middle, you've also then got the B series chipset, so we're looking at B760 in the middle of the line with the H series budget oriented chipsets at the bottom. It's a similar story with AMD, where you have X670 and X670E at the top, and B650 and B650E towards the mid range. Top end chipsets will give wider support for PCI Generation 5, a feature you shouldn't get too drawn into, as current gen graphics cards, even the 4090, only require a PCI Gen 4 slot, and even support features like memory or CPU overclocking. For Intel processors, you'll need to make sure you get a Z series motherboard for processor based overclocking and a CPU that ends with the letter K. That indicates it's unlocked and available to be overclocked. AMD, you need an X series or a B series chipset to overclock your CPU. And while both standards technically support it, X series is going to give better overclocking mileage due to more beefy cooling and designs that, let's face it, are more geared up towards faster CPU clock speeds than the manufacturer provides out of the box. When you're looking at Intel, most motherboards over $220 or so have Gen 5 support for M.2 drives and graphics cards, while on the AMD side, only boards that end with the suffix E support that PCI Gen 5 tech. But otherwise, motherboards don't really affect the performance of your build. While higher-end motherboards have better connectivity, allowing for, you know, more devices to be plugged in, or those devices to run at faster speeds, you're not actually going to experience bottlenecks for your CPU, memory, or your GPU when it comes to a motherboard. That's not to say I'd recommend picking the cheapest Intel motherboard feasibly available, but you don't have to spend a fortune to get solid motherboard performance. But what about other components? Where do people often make mistakes picking these parts? The case is a good one. Once again, as long as the airflow is good to keep temperatures down, a case has no effect on the performance of your build. Aesthetically, it makes a huge difference, but whether or not you prioritize that and want to spend lots of money to be afforded higher aesthetics is another question. We've done a video on the best cases you can buy in 2023, which we'll link up here if you want some nice, easy pointers. Make sure your case supports the length of your graphics card and the form factor of your motherboard, as these basic compatibility points make a big difference. Plus, make sure your case has at least three included fans for plenty of intake and exhaust airflow. If it doesn't, you'd be better spending another $20 on a case that does, as buying these fans separately aftermarket can get pricey. Power supplies are another good example. We highly recommend PC Part Picker, which you can chew through all your components, and it will give you an estimated total wattage of your system. Now, you should always add plenty of margin on top of this, as you want plenty of headroom for a power supply, but don't go overboard. Take a look at our on-screen guide now for the recommended power supply wattages for each available graphics card. Of course, if you've got a PC that you're going to overclock to the max, really powerful CPU, loads of memory, 100 hard drives, you will want a bigger power supply. But don't go silly. Even the latest RTX 4080s don't require 1300 watts or something stupid like that. And there are other areas too in a system where you should be careful. SSDs, for example, are even an area where you can find some bottleneck in. Make sure you get a Gen 3 or a Gen 4 NVMe drive with speeds over two gigabytes a second really for any modern graphics card as slower drives can cause issues especially on high-end GPUs. Say you pick up a 4080 and you pair it with a slow SATA SSD you will see bottleneck in because the cards are so powerful that they need fast storage to churn through all of the available game data. You'll also find a similar story when it comes to cooling. Make sure you have adequate CPU cooling and try and avoid the included stock CPU coolers on anything more powerful than an i3. If you've got really good case airflow, you can often get away with
with the included cooler, but a tower or liquid cooler will work well. And if you're not overclocking, go a bit cheaper on the cooler. You don't need to spend more than 50 or $60 unless you want to push that CPU to 6 gigahertz or whatever speed the chip you've selected is, plus, I don't know, 10 or 15%. Now, there's a lot of information to take in here, but James, what are the three key takeaways that you should really remember above all when picking parts for a build? First is you want to make sure you're not spending disproportionately lots more money on one part compared to another. For a gaming rig, the GPU is always going to be the most expensive individual part, but make sure you've got an adequate CPU to pair up with it. Once again, our on-screen guide now gives you a good idea, but basically an i3 or a Ryzen 3 processor is good for any GPU below $200. Spend more than that and you want a Ryzen 5 or i5. Jump up to anything from a 4080 tier graphics card or above and an i7 or i9 will be the flavor of the day. Think about future proofing and upgradability later, but don't obsess over it. The last thing you want to do is build a system that can be easily upgraded for a future possible mystical <laughs> Ryzen 9 11 4452X only for your system to only ever survive with a low end Ryzen 5. You'd be better off spending that money on a higher end CPU in the first instance and reallocating any money you find later to either building a new PC or some setup upgrades elsewhere. There's no point in a higher motherboard if it only ever suffers with a mid range CPU because you thought a bit too much about upgradability. Same with stuff like RAM, DDR5 is great for future proofing, but don't sweat it. If you're going to build a whole new PC anyway, $80 on some new RAM, and of course DDR5 is only going to continue to get cheaper, doesn't seem like such a massive expense later after all. And remember, your storage drives can always be taken with you. Even if you want faster storage one day, that Gen 3 or Gen 4 NVMe you've bought now on a budget will serve as a great secondary drive later. Also make sure you think about dimensions, there's nothing more anticlimactic than building a PC, getting it all in and finding the graphics card or cooler doesn't fit. Trust me, I've been there this morning and it wasn't very fun to make sure you keep one eye on that and consider all the dimensions once all the components have been installed in the case of your choice. Read plenty of reviews on your case, see build guides in it, and just get a feel for the layout and how different components are going to impact what space is available for your other components. An empty case is all well and good until you start filling it up. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like rating. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.